USDC, the stablecoin now native to four blockchains, could soon be on eight to ten more networks. More bullish news, as CoinDesk has learned. It'd be the broadest expansion of the 25 billion stablecoin uh, to date, potentially surpassing the eight blockchains that support Tether's USDT, the market leader with a 63 billion market cap. Joining us now to discuss is Jeremy Allaire, co-founder, chairman, and CEO of Circle, the pioneering force behind stablecoin USDC. Welcome to the show, Jeremy. So perhaps you can confirm this news. Good to have you on the show. Perhaps you could confirm this news, and if so, perhaps uh, you can outline the challenges and significance of this expansion. Yeah, so a, a couple of comments. So, I, um, you know, Center Consortium, which is the governance organization um, around USDC and, and really seeks to build a set of standards for ultimately the kind of global expansion of fiat digital currency models, obviously USDC being the first. Um, Center Consortium, um, you know, sort of certifies um, different blockchains as, as you know, p- having the potential to be uh, chains that support USDC. And Center put out uh, uh, an announcement this morning that it had sort of approved for um, potential use uh, upwards of, of 10 incremental blockchains. Now, um, Circle itself has, has launched support uh, for USDC on a number of chains, as, as you've noted. And um, and I, you know, I, I think this is just all part of an effort to ensure that the, you know, the preeminent trusted dollar digital currency standard, um, which is a really important protocol that a lot of people are integrating with and building on top of, that it's as widely available as possible and as, as on as many important platforms as possible. As I like to say, we want our digital dollars to be cross-platform. Each major blockchain platform is like a platform, and so it's really just underscoring that commitment to. Uh, having mm. widespread interoperability um, for you know dollar digital currency in the world seems to be a theme this morning. Also, Coinbase is taking on the banks. It seems debuting a savings account product that yields a four percent annual percentage yield on USDC stablecoin deposits, and that that's obviously higher than what traditional savings accounts can traditionally offer. So, is Coinbase going to eat the banks, take away their lunch money with with these savings accounts? Well, I think there's a very big thing happening here, and it's been going on for really on an accelerating basis over the last 18 months, which is once you have a trusted, reliable dollar digital currency on blockchains, you know, effectively capital market functions are being built around that. And so you've seen this incredible growth in DeFi lending markets built around USDC. You've seen a lot of growth in CFI lending mar- markets built around USDC. And, and that actually led us Circle just two weeks ago to announce Circle Yield, which is it's not a retail product. It's not a savings product for end users, but it's for corporate treasurers. So businesses of, of almost any size that want to take some of their capital, their dollars, and allocate it into USDC yield markets is tr- a tremendous opportunity to do that. Business balance sheets, financial institution balance sheets are orders of magnitude larger than than consumer balance sheets. And so there's a, just a huge opportunity for USDC yield. Um, we're, we're providing that uh, now today to corporations and, and financial institutions. And then also just days ago, you know, Compound announced its own institutionally focused, uh, you know, uh, yield product, also a 4% USDC yield product, also in partnership with Circle to deliver that using our just announced DeFi API that allows businesses to integrate DeFi USDC yield into their own products and services. So there's a lot happening here. I think our view is that over the coming years, essentially, um, you know, capital allocation, capital intermediation, various forms of lending are going to be denominated more and more in digital currency. And I think these next generation of you know, crypto native financial services companies are, are really poised uh, to, to be, you know, major providers of those products. Welcome back, Jeremy. Um, just to turn more to the macro view, since the last time we had you on the show, there seems to have been some advances in the U.S. government exploring a central bank digital currency. So I just wanted to turn back to that topic. I guess my first question is, do you think there will be a central bank digital currency, a U.S. digital dollar? And if so, what does that mean for stable coins? I mean, do you still need stable coins in a, if there is a digital dollar? Will they be competing? I, I would just love to hear your view on, on the prospects for this. Yeah, I mean, I, I think... I, 
there are a few things here. I think the first is we are seeing an extraordinary amount of velocity and innovation in public blockchain infrastructure and in the protocols built on top of those public blockchain infrastructures and private digital currency models that are run within the regulatory perimeter of the United States who have fiduciary standards that are met within the, the banking supervisory standards, those models are going to grow rapidly and proliferate, not just in the United States, but around the world. And that pace of innovation, uh, as noted, is really, really accelerating. So I think the interesting question is, there are certainly research projects, white papers, things like that, but to actually uh, build something to be operational uh, rather than aspirational, I think is a very different matter. We're seeing very clear statements out of many different quarters, including leadership of the Fed, uh, including, you know, last week, uh, a, a really key piece published by the New York Fed on their website, making the case that private digital currency models um, are going to be critically important. You've seen this at the G20 level with the acceptance that global stable coins are, are likely going to become systemically important uh, payment market infrastructures. All this points to very, very robust global development of private sector led innovation and open internet led innovation in these fiat digital currency models. There are theoretical things in the future um, are, are around um, you know, government issued digital currency. I think that in the West and in the United States, uh, society is going to really demand the, the kind of innovation and, and the kind of trajectory that open technology has delivered for the rest of the internet, they're going to want to see the same thing for advances in digital money. But does the U.S. government actually need to issue a digital dollar? Like, is this even a necessary thing or are we fine with the, you know, proliferation it, it of is, private stablecoins? It, it, the, 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 the central government absolutely does not need to issue a digital currency. Um, you know, th there are uh, electronic bank deposits with the Fed uh, and then you have digital currency innovations on top of that. That's exactly what USDC is today. It sits inside that two-tiered banking system. Virtually every form of electronic money that we've had in the past 75 years has been a private sector-led innovation where private sector actors are building standards and consortiums for interoperability, whether that's the international wire system, uh, how, how you know, uh, electronic checks were ultimately scaled to clear through the clearinghouse. What we all know of as the sort of first uh, major consumer generation of electronic payments in the form of mag stripes and cards, and then later innovations like tap to pay, NFC payments, Apple Pay, PayPal, et cetera. All of these are these incredible in innovations that have come through the adoption of standards by a wide range of private sector actors working together. There's no reason to think that in the next two to three years, that same kind of model in private dollar digital currency mechanisms are not going to achieve internet scale with billions of people using them. And so I think that will ultimately obviate the need for the Fed to be even looking at this. Hi, Jeremy. Uh, you brought up uh, central banks um, and general positive comments about uh, stable coins. But uh, Boston Fed President Eric Rosengren, he, he cited Tether specifically as a uh, challenge to financial stability. And, and USDC positions itself as the antithesis of Tether. But, uh, you know, a lot of people on, particularly on social media, are, are, are concerned about uh, what you list on your attestations as what you call approved investments um, as one of the assets, as essentially the assets where the uh, USDC assets go. Um, and, and people are saying, look, this is no different than what Tether does with its uh, commercial paper, where it's kind of murky as to what commercial paper, uh -huh. commercial paper it owns. So what exactly are in approved investments? Who approves it? And, you know, what percentage of the assets are in that category? Yeah, so there's just dramatic differences between uh, the, the way that USDC is governed and, and regulated and the fiduciary responsibility that, that comes along with that versus something like Tether. So just to start, um, and, and this is, I think, that most people don't really understand, USDC exists under a regulated regime in the United States. It exists under the rules of electronic stored value and money transmission. Um, Circle is licensed and is supervised by banking supervisors throughout the United States. We are audited by top uh, global accounting firms and we're audited against our compliance with law. 
those uh, those regulations, which which by the way include regular government examiners coming in and looking at the books and records of the company and, and, and ensuring that we are in fact in compliance with all of those supervisory requirements. That's just like a, a level of just, first of all, fiduciary accountability that is just completely lacking in a system like Tether. The second is that if you actually look at it and understand it, those, uh, those laws, uh, are the same laws that govern the you know thirty five billion dollars of of balances that are held by PayPal or all of the dollars that sit with Square or Apple Pay or Stripe in all of their platforms. It's the exact same regulatory framework. So we live underneath that. Uh, within that universe, we are we are basically constrained uh, from a consumer protection perspective to ensure full reserve and 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 effectively you know, complete liquidity at all times. And so there's a very, very narrow uh, set of uh, permissible financial instruments that are able to be held. That is a, a fairly narrow and restrictive set of covenants that we have to follow or we're breaking the law. And then even within that, uh, Circle operates in an even more narrow, more bounded, more conservative uh, posture. And that's something that actually we set as a set of standards with Center Consortium. So that we're sort of saying, okay, here's what the law allows for regulated financial institutions that are doing electronic money uh, in, in most of the world, including the United States. We're going to do something that's even more conservative uh, because that's really critical to you know, really but, building that trust uh, around a, a digital currency model I, like USDC. Yeah, I, you know, so I mean, I guess some of the concerns is what exactly is in that list of approved investments is would that include corporate debt for instance and if so what kind of what grade who grades them um yeah. and, and also just how much cash is actually there yeah so um we have a mandate to obviously always ensure that 100 percent liquidity and shock test that etc i think anyone can go and look at the laws and so what i would encourage uh you guys to do and others is to actually go see what is allowable and understand that we're um, very much uh, more conservative than that. And what's important is that this is a regulated financial infrastructure uh, and right. we are held to an accountability there. there it's, you know, if you go on crypto Twitter, you have people uh, you know, who are speculating, oh, this is fractional reserve or these guys are doing this or that. I would be in jail if that were the case. I have got govern government examiners, public auditors, and all these folks that are, that are holding us to account. And the other thing I always want to reserve people uh, to, to, to remind people is that Dollar balances that you hold with your Chase account or your Bank of America account, et cetera, those are fractional reserve dollars. Uh, you, you don't actually have a dollar there. You have an IOU, and then they're taking that and they're rehypothecating it at a 10x leverage. Um, that's what banks do. They create I money. Guess, We're building a full reserve model that is so, built within the, the, the highest level of prudential standards that exist in the world in the US regulated banking system. And, and we've been doing that consistently and holding. Uh, and publishing attestations from top accounting firms for three years straight. And no one else so can claim that. So to allay some of the, the concerns, I mean, can you at least give a, a, some examples of what would be counted as an approved investment? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, if you, if you, if you look at it, it's obviously cash. It's, uh, it, it, it's uh, you know, government treasuries, those types of short-term instruments. Um, and, you know, th those are, you know, a, a huge, huge component of this. So we don't break out the actual individual line items in USDC reserves. Um, but what we, we do is obviously publish exactly what we're required to do. Uh, and we make it very clear that we're holding ourselves to an even higher standard. Fascinating discussion. Yeah, everyone is interested who, what is exactly backing these Yeah, I mean, these they, they, they really should be. I mean, obviously, you know, electronic money regimes exist all around the world. Um, we paved the way to become one of the very first crypto electronic money issuers in the world. Mm -hmm. We've been doing that since 2014, working closely with regulators on that. This is obviously becoming really big from 4 billion yeah. to 25 or 26 guess, billion in a short period of time. One, one last question, if I could just inject it there really quickly. So, you know, and this kind of relates to what I was talking about before with, with Coinbase, you know, they're, they're offering these, this annual percentage yield. It's a little less than what other crypto lenders are offering uh, at around 8%. And the reason why is that Coinbase is offering a comparatively lower yield because it doesn't lend to identified third parties, which makes everyone wonder who, who are these identified third parties. I don't know if you could weigh in on that. 
Yeah, so I, I, I don't know how they're defining that as well. I'm not sure exactly what that means. What I can tell you is that um, with Circle Yield, that is an institutional grade product. It is a regulated product. It's actually the first you know, uh, crypto uh, yield product that is regulated by a significant uh, you know, financial regulator. It's also a, a fully secured product so that the, the USDC that is lent out through the platform is over collateralized on our platform, which is very, very significant. And then it's ultimately going, um, that, that is lent out through exclusively high quality prime institutional distribution. And so uh, w our distribution is obviously, uh, uh, and, and lending out is, is with mm -hmm. kind of very high quality institutional borrowers mm -hmm. on the other side of that.